Hey devs, April here. Welcome back to the Appian Community YouTube channel. It's been an amazing 2023, and I can't say thank you enough to our YouTube team, our amazing guests, and most of all, to you, the audience, for coming along for the ride. Today, we have a special live stream to close out the year, celebrating a great year by looking forward to the future with our holiday eye party. Today, I'm joined by four amazing guests who are each deeply involved with AI and automation here at Appian. This conversation is about sharing some of the amazing features that are available now, as well as looking forward to Appian's vision for a mixed autonomy future. I know that there's a lot of skepti skepticism around AI. I have some too. So this is your chance to ask the experts. I will be monitoring the chat throughout the stream so that we can answer your questions. Also, at the end of the stream, we'll be announcing the raffle winners for our developer sentiment survey. So stick around to the end to see if you've won one of our great prizes. Without any further ado, it's my pleasure to bring out Julian, Sam, Lewis, and Kyle. Hello, friends. All right. Let's start with some intros. I know we have a couple of familiar faces and a, and a couple of newer ones. So we'll just go around the horn here. Julian, who are you? What do you do here? And uh, why should we pay attention to what you're saying? <laughs> sure. Thanks, April. Um, yeah, my name is Julian Grunauer. I'm a technology strategy engineer on the CTO team. Um, our team is mainly responsible for kind of two broad cut categories. Uh, one of them is our technology partnerships. So in the past year, if you've uh, paid attention to the app market, we've had some explosive plugins uh, to Esri, Teams, Adobe, Splunk, Symfony, just whole bunch of other services that Appian can connect to natively, make it really easy for you to kind of drag and drop, set up ways to read data, write data to external services. Um, and then the other big category has to do with AI, um, so technology strategy. Our team basically researches, sees um, kind of what our competitors are doing, what's happening in the field, what customers want, what developers want, and tries to implement them um, in the product. So if you've seen a lot of the AI plugins that have been on the app market, uh, those have been built by myself and my team. Um, yeah, and we've been doing some really exciting work and really excited to share this with all of you. Awesome. Thanks, Julian. Sam, what about you? Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Sam Merrill. I'm a product strategy manager here at Appian, and I actually work for Malcolm Ross, the VP of product strategy. Uh, you guys may have seen on the main stage, he does the product webinars every quarter. <laughs> Uh, so basically our function in product strategy is to help, you know, the roadmap of engineering by getting some of those uh, bleeding edge technologies, trying to bring them into the platform and seeing if there's a market fit. Uh, you know, things that we've helped bring in is intelligent document processing, RPA, and uh, some of these new Gen AI things working with Julian. But uh, other aspects of my job is actually uh, working with the analysts that review Appian software. So. Uh, firms like Gartner, Forrester, and representing our product the best light for them, making sure we have good reviews and stay in that leadership quadrant so that we are bringing you guys the best platform from a market perspective is my day in and day out job. Great. Uh, also, thanks for coming dressed up for the holiday eye party, Sam. Yeah. I uh, appreciate the swag over there. It's, it's not lit up, but uh, <laughs> yeah, we're ready to roll and uh, excited for the, uh, the holiday season. Cool. All right, Lewis, uh, people may recognize you from the AI skills live stream, but if anyone missed that, can you uh, introduce yourself again? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Lewis Brensky. I'm a senior product manager within our cognitive uh, automation group within engineering. And I've been at Appian for a number of years, originally focusing on our intelligent document processing features and now AI skills and AI copilot more broadly. Cool. And yeah, so Sam mentioned IDP also, and kind of Sam and Julian are POCs, like, let's see if we can make it work. And then when they have something, then they hand it off to engineering. And then Lewis and product management are like, okay, how do we prioritize getting this into the platform for real? So it's a nice team uh, effort uh, that goes across the board. And then, of course, Kyle, very familiar face. Uh, quick intro, Kyle. Yeah. Uh, thank you, April. Thanks for continuing to have me uh kyle miller product evangelist um so this i think is my third live stream so some, i might be doing something right uh i similar to sam try to show the product off in the best light and uh in that vein i will be demoing today so yeah cool and kyle's really good at demoing 
<laughs> I jinxed him on a, on a past live stream. People may remember. Um, okay, so let's let's jump right into it to something that has been kind of like all the rage. It's being talked a lot about a lot, but I know that there's a lot of skepticism in the developer community about it. So Sam, I'm going to give you the hard question to start of, you know, what is Copilot and why should we care? Well, uh, yeah, great question. I think uh, Copilots in general, they've been around for a while, but I think where we've really seen them, you know, take off in popularity was with the introduction of the generative AI capabilities of open AI almost a year ago now is when actually we saw that release. I don't know if you guys logged on to ChatGPT about a couple of weeks ago, but it was celebrating its birthday right at the end of November there. And I think GitHub Copilot was always like seen as a developer productivity tool. It could help inspect code, uh, alert you of errors uh, within the code base or vulnerabilities, but it wasn't really, it was more of a niche thing that GitHub was kind of focused on. But with this whole generative AI surge, the Copilots have been embedded everywhere not just with the big major cloud vendor platforms like GCP, AWS, and Azure, uh, but all the low code vendors, Appian being one of them, and all of your IDEs that you work with uh, day in and day out. It, uh, I was reading a Gartner report right before this, and it says about 80% of uh, developers are using some sort of a co-pilot within their integrated development environment for uh, you know code completion, catching errors. Um, uh, best thing you can do is like, type in a natural language and have a conversation with the copilot and say, hey, can you explain to me this uh, this this block of code? I don't really understand it. Or is there a more efficient way to write it? Uh, generating on-demand scripts for you and just inserting them. And then the DevSecOps lifecycle as well, uh, catching vulnerabilities and uh, doing code reviews. It's almost like a thing of the past where we're having these long merge cycles where now it's becoming much easier to deploy with it as well. So I think GitHub, it's Copilot really helped with the deployment and the DevSecOps and validating that. But where ChatGPT came online and now everyone's embedding LLMs everywhere, it's really helping developer productivity. And so I think that's one of the big things tying this all back to what Appian is doing with our embedded capabilities is helping you, the designer, be more productive. You know, focusing less on the menial day, to, day in and day out and helping you do those tasks quicker so you can focus on higher value added uh, things like design thinking, right? System thinking, uh, separating out your concerns and modularizing more aspects of your, your programs, these more architect, uh, based roles. You can be the architect now as a, as a designer and do the, the, the one-off tasks much more effective and efficiently and knowing the copilot will have your back because you're deploying code that is secure, validated and, uh, running effectively. Yeah, I think um, that's something that Appian has always done, right, is we try to make things easier for you uh, so that you can focus on more interesting problems and tasks and not, you know, fighting with the technology. So I think, you know, that's a great vision for Copilot. But right now, where are we with Copilot um, and like what developers can make use of now? Because I, I, I don't know that we're quite there yet at that vision of of helping with the full like life cycle like github but we do have some cool uses for copilot now right oh yeah uh i don't know if we're demoing this yet but we have this new um yeah, pdf to sale copilot that's uh the ai copilot's actually embedded in the interface designer where you can drop in a, a pdf form uh whatever it may be your w2 or a, a financial statement form for uh you know taxes and you can just drop that form right into the copilot and then it'll app what it will do behind the scenes with their intelligent document processing. It will know exactly what is in that form. And then with the foundational large language model, be able to generate the sale for you automatically. So I think we'll see a demo of this, but I think what that can help with, uh, if you are tasked with building a form is being able to automatically get a nice UI UX styled form within minutes, instead of having to go through dragging and dropping all of your form elements in, but we go much beyond just a basic form. We're, we're generating it in a nice style. We're generating the instructions of the form. And then we have the different components as well. So if there is a place on the form for your signature, well, we're going to go ahead, understand that generate, generate the sale for it so that the component that we add in the interface is actually the signature component. 
or the radio buttons or a drop down with all the states. And we go beyond just giving you just the components, but we also tie it back to a dictionary. I think the form data dictionary where every single input is backed by your save value, your, your, your value of the dictionary. So you have a downstream object that you can store all that form data. So you can pass it along to your processes, your RPA bots, you can weave it into uh, your reporting, all very compact and a nice dictionary element. And it's all there for you right out of the box. So I think it definitely streamlines that form building development. And uh, I mean, we could talk about some other things, April, because I know people are skeptical <laughs> of these kind of things where, you know, they, they know we have the low code capabilities of the design mode, but a lot of people just hop right into that expression mode. So maybe you want to speak to some of that. Sure. Yeah. And actually, while you were talking, it another connection happened yeah. for me, which is, you know, from the beginning of learning Appian, I was always in the uh, stale recipes on docs. And now we have design.appian.com and we have right an interface interface designer, like the templates that you can start from. And those have always been amazing starting points, but they're filled with sample data that's not really relevant to me and I need to go in and switch them all out. So it really is like a template on steroids to be able to have it with all the fields you already need and want um, to start with. Um, so wait, I, I just lost my, my train of thought, Sam. Um, should we go into records chat? Is that, was that the segue you were trying to help make? No, I was actually, what you brought up with the templates. I, oh. I think those are great starters, right? Yeah. They're great. They're great ways to bootstrap and scaffold, right? Yeah. And get going quickly or get inspiration. And we also yeah. have the sale, saledesign.com where you can go and get inspiration for, uh, you know, templating and the, the sort of apps and interfaces and UIX yeah. is what we have that best practices and standards all yeah. up there. So you draw inspiration from, but sometimes what you're saying is when you bring in a template, yeah. you're left with a big scaffolding mess yeah. and you're like, uh, is this, is this causing more work than it was supposed to end up solving yeah. in the first place? Right. I got to yeah. go in, tailor it to what I need. Yeah. Just the heck with it. You throw it all away and you start from scratch. Sometimes yeah. it happens. Yeah. So if there, if you are that, you know, pro designer, You've been with Appian for a while and you're the you're the type of persona where you switch from design mode to expression mode immediately right out of the box uh you're not dealing with the drag and drop well you might not think that this pdf to sale uh feature is relevant to you but i would say it is yeah. uh in a couple ways because what it does help with is giving you a inspiration for what that form may look like in an in a in a, in a, in a yeah. ui ux in a, in a digital form right so instead of having to print the form out on paper or see it in a PDF view, what you could do is just download the form, drop it into the AI, uh, Appian AI Copilot, know it's all secure, know that the, the foundational model is private and all that data is secure to your uh, enterprise, and then have Appian do the scaffolding for you. And then you might not even use that scaffolding, but what you could do is have a drawn out side-by-side -side view, see how Appian rendered it, and then start taking in your design library components, yeah. your styling, and build it out much faster. So you don't have to think about yeah. what the radio, but should this be a radio button or should this be a, yeah. a drop down or a, a checkbox, right? right? You can you can let Appian do that lift for you so yeah. you can be more creative with your work. Yeah. And and to your point on design mode versus, versus expression mode, a quick like aside, but I do encourage uh, developers out there. I, I did a, a hackathon last week, uh, with a lot of folks who, you know, for years have not switched to design mode and, uh, some of the tasks in the hackathon encouraged them to do that. And they were like pretty impressed, um, with how far it's come along. So especially if you are a developer who's been doing this for a while and maybe are not as used to design mode every quarter, I really recommend at least trying some of the things in design mode, because things like setting up a record back chart is like so much faster to configure. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot that's helpful. And call another, layout, call of, yeah, everything, yeah. everything. And oh, another yeah. thing, super easy to configure with drag and drop uh, records chat. <laughs> there's the segue now. Okay, yeah, Lewis, you, you want to talk about record chat? I don't know if we have do we have the site ready, Kyle? Yeah. Um, yeah, let's get into it then. All right. Yeah, absolutely. So you may have seen it in our uh, recent product announcement webinar, but uh, as of 23.4, we've uh, recently introduced a new uh, records chat component. 
Uh, so this is a new AI co-pilot feature, um, but as opposed to being targeted at making developers' lives easier like the PDF to sale feature is, uh, this component is intended to help out your end users. So what this component allows you to do is from the context of a an interface, you can chat with your records data um, and easily ask questions about uh, both the main record itself and also its related fields. So as Kyle's shown here, all you have to do is drag out the uh, records component or records chat component into your interface. You configure a few fields like the uh, record that you're communicating with, um, its identifier, and also the related data that you want to pull in. And that's all you need to do. Um, this feature is designed with our low code developers in mind. So it doesn't require you to do any prompt engineering or, or direct interaction with the LLM that backs this component. Um, that's all taken care of behind the scenes. And we found it to be uh, extremely quick to set up, but also powerful for end users who are trying to understand vast amounts of record data in a short period of time. Yeah. And um, Lewis, to your point about, you know, this is really something for end users. When it's something for end users, it's something to make you all look good as developers, because how impressed are the end users going to be when now they can ask questions about their order or their case uh, in a chatbot that they're used to from using other things like ChatGPT, um, right, right there in Appian with just, you know, I don't know, how long did this take you, Kyle? One minute? It's 90 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> yeah. Just one minute. Uh, yeah. Now I'm just like testing it. So I only configured, uh, three fields here. So the record, the identifier, and the, uh, the fields, which all the fields I wanted were already in a rule. Uh, that's very convenient, uh, just typing them all out. So first question I asked is, who's the primary contact for this order? And we see here, uh, it pulled up, it was Mike Harold. <laughs> Mike might say I said his last name wrong, but we got his email, his phone number, and that was pretty simple. I, I like that. Let's see how yeah. else, what else I can ask it. Yeah, when yeah. um oh I was gonna I was gonna say so we at this hackathon last week we used uh the records chat feature, which you know of course no one had touched and it's pretty amazing with Appy and how with new features they feel familiar enough where it's easy to learn even if you've never experienced it before. And I was pretty impressed by the records chat in that there were some so we did sports data and there were some abbreviations for different sports stats that the records chat knew what those abbreviations meant. Like if I was like, what player had the most PPG, it would be like, oh, this player had the most points per game in this season. And so um, people, were, people were pretty impressed by that. Um, Lewis, what, what were you going to add about Records Chat? Oh, I was just going to, to mention that um, we see a lot of value in, in this feature for uh, uh, a good example is case workers or in case management applications. Um, it helps people who are either trying to come up to speed on a case that they're unfamiliar with quickly, or maybe they, for let's take the example of a customer service representative, if they're on the phone with a customer and need to access information quickly, um, they don't need to navigate through this dense record interface like the one we're looking for uh, or looking at. They can just ask the question they have um, and get an answer within seconds. Yeah. Um, so I also see the. AI Copilot in the in the top right that we were just talking about with Sam about the PDF form. Kyle, do you have a PDF form we could use for that or or not 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 for this demo? Did I? We'll have to have you back on next year to do it unless no, I. You know I have one. So. Oh. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> so right. I, so I was I was gonna say because this you know it takes a little while for the AI to do the work for you, but uh, maybe while you are just setting this up and we can see how easy it is to just upload the form. Um, sure, I just want to call out some points yep. on the form and then I'll just let it do uh, all the work in the background. So uh, a couple call outs here. I know sometimes when we're configuring states, you have to do like uh, have all your states listed somewhere, probably in a uh, consonant or something. And then you have to configure that drop down, and then you have to configure a signature box. So all that's going to be done for us. So uh, let me just upload the form. It's a workers' compensation form. Uh, after you upload something, the first thing it asks you is, do you want to generate instructions? I always say yes, but it's very nice to have that on the side. And yeah, I mean, I'm just going to let it do the work, and you guys will see for yourself. <laughs> so OK, so while that's going, what I was going to ask, um... And you know, this is a big thing that comes up. We have a lot of 
uh, customers out there who have a lot of security considerations in mind and privacy considerations. So I don't know if Lewis, you want to pass it on to maybe Sam, because he's used to uh, giving these kind of talks to, to Gartner and all that. But what if uh, my customer is afraid to use records chat because, oh, I don't know that this is secure. Yeah, I can I can actually take that one. So, right. so records chat, um, it is powered by Appian's private AI. Um, so not only does all of the data that you are processing stay within Appian security and compliance boundaries that we guarantee to you as our customer, um, you also get the functionality of record security. So the only data that will be sent to the LLM for processing from the record that you're in the context of um, and the only answers that the customer will see or that the user will see is what they have access to as a user. So we won't accidentally um, send data from a field that that user uh, doesn't have access to in the record and expose that information to them. Yeah. yeah, that's kind of the cool thing about the fact that it's built off of records. You get that user level security out of the box. You don't have to set anything else up. Uh, the user themselves doesn't see information that they don't have access to. The LLM doesn't see information that you don't want to sell, send to the LLM. Um, all of that security is kind of handled for you. And that's part of Appian's guarantee there that um, it's secure out of the box. It's private AI out of the box. You own it. It's in your security and compliance boundaries. Um, and it's just as easy to set up um, in, in the record. Yeah, I think, you know, always making, always making the case for records. But it is really true that Appian is making big investments with records and every quarter we release more and more features that if you have those synced records already set up it is so easy for you to get that extra free power right away so if you haven't already i'm always encouraging you to get on that synced records train because uh, i could talk about that till i'm blue in the face about how much i love records <laughs> we should get shirts uh also this form is done yeah, I mean, it took like a minute. <laughs> That's no time at all to do all this. Like, I I could not do all this in less than a minute. So this is pretty awesome to get started with. And um, I like to think of this feature as kind of the uh, finishing off IDP, if you will. Because ID, like Appian, one of Appian's main value props, right, is making paper processes easy, digitizing them, making a seamless digital transformation so that you no longer have to deal with stacks and stacks of forms. They have to process manually all the time and energy, right? IDP makes that easy by actually extracting the values, right? Extracting the values from the form, plugging them into a digital interface. Well, what if you want to digitize the form itself? This is kind of like the reverse of it, where instead of grabbing the values, you're saying, no, 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 let's start from the very beginning. Let's digitize this process first, um, easily transform that paper form into a digital form. So you don't even have to deal with those, uh, those paper values. You can instantly have that uh, Appian process uh, built out, no longer uh, having to rely on IDP or any of the paper, you can just build it out instantly in Appian um, to make it an even faster um, process. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's also ahead. a great, great way to get uh, other entry level designers, or maybe you have interns that are learning the platform that are on your team to show them firsthand what Appian's all about. Where, hey, I'm, I'm taking a blank interface and we're putting this form. Appian's going to interpret that, and then they can see it all generate. And now the pro designer or the, the mentor can say, hey, now switch over to expression mode and look at how all this is declared. You can see it's a signature component. It's all uh, very declarative. Or you know, you brought in a signature to name that, right? And then they can actually start piecing it together. Like, oh, okay, this is how, oh, and that's how you tie it to the data. Because when I input my first name, they see it on the local variable refresh and they can start piecing together. So I think it's also a tool to help bring people up to speed on the platform who may be new. And so it's another way you can utilize this tool as that pro designer persona and helping people in your organization understand Appian. It bridges that gap, not only between people who are coming into Appian as new programmers, but also the business. Because if you need, sometimes you need to sell, your, sell the platform you're gonna be doing a big project on. So what better way to do that than to, if you're in a meeting and you're deciding on this new app or new initiative in the company, new project, and the business people are around a table you come in you say, hey, we should definitely use Appian because it's a process automation. It's perfectly handled for this use case. And then you show them this capability. They're going to be like, we should use that. Yeah. And that's my marketer. That's my marketer uh, coming out, helping you because 
I think what gen what this generative AI is actually really doing is leveling the playing field. So we all can be a marketer for a day, a sales guy for a day. You can get these tools, but maybe a sales guy can't be a developer for a day. We should just not let that happen, right? We just... <laughs> You're losing the audience, Sam. <laughs> <laughs> Sam's a, a, a developer who who turned um, sales sales. I'm guy. just saying, there's many different ways of, a, of applying this these features, and as they get as they progress, they are going to become more powerful within Appian. So soon, we're just going to be speaking, uh, having a conversation with these uh, embedded copilots, and they're going to be helping you build entire application suites. Not there yet, but we'll be growing yeah. at that point. I mean, we're all, always looking forward, right? Always. To, to Sam's point, honestly, I've been here for two years now, and every quarter it gets easier to develop an app. Again, so. I know. It goes back to Matt's orig original mission statement, right? Yeah. Every two years, half the time it takes to build an app, I, it keeps coming true. Yeah. You know? That's true. Yeah. Uh, Sam, Sam and I were actually in Academy together over five years ago. And so we had built our first apps together and we're, out grinding it out trying to get our project done and i always think back sam like if we tried to build those academy projects now oh we could probably do it in four hours like i, I, I really i'm just so anyway uh we do have a question that came in the chat so can we use the copilot for getting documents like we have some records where we have a lot of documents so we provide a name or something and ai will help us with the document Maybe, maybe it might need a clarifier on that or do kind of see where the question is going. Is that like a RAG use case, Julian, you think? Or like? I think they mean it's, that they are yeah. storing the document on the record itself and then they want to extract it from the record and pass it in here. Um, I, I, I'm honestly not sure, but it's easy enough to just download and drag it in. It takes like two seconds. Oh, so uh, maybe the question is around, can you automate generating these forms based on a document and you know yeah. i mean you could maybe use rpa on affian no no no, no. i'm not uh, promoting that anyway uh okay so this is really cool uh do any of you all have any more points on copilot or record chat or also chat uh tuning in at home if you have any other questions on this please throw them in uh otherwise we're going to give Julian a chance to get really uh, nerdy on us and talk about the back end. No, it's around the AI chat bot. Oh, the copilot chat bot. Can the yeah. chat bot return documents? Maybe that's the question. Oh, okay. So, so today it, it can't return documents. It will respond just with uh, natural language text um, based on the data in the record instance itself. Um, this one of the uh, the focus of this feature is initially on a single record instance, as, as you might have noticed from the demo. Um, as we've talked about a lot today, um, we do have vision for these features expanding both for our end user copilot features and also our developer copilot features. So while this is limited to chatting with structured data in a single record today, we'd like to expand it to the entire record list and to data that's stored in documents as well in the future. Yeah, uh, that, that's a good point. And I guess that also probably plays into the security thing for now and making people feel a little bit better. It's in the context of this one record that you already have access to. Um, let's see, I, I see another question. Hey guys, any specific type of PDF needed for Copilot? We tried a sample doc and it doesn't work the way it was shown here. Does this work with GPT 3.5 model? So those are multiple questions, I guess. So I guess start with what what should the PDF be like? Lewis, correct me if I'm wrong, it has to be fillable and search or, or search, searchable, right? Fillable or searchable it, PDF. It has to be a natively digital PDF. So like one that has a, a text layer that you can highlight and copy and paste from. Um, I do think that if there are fillable fields, it, it helps um, generate a more robust or more accurate uh, version of the form, but I don't think they're required. Um, one scenario you might have run into whoever submitted the question is that if you upload like a scan document that doesn't have that text layer, um, it won't be able to, to generate the, the sale from that PDF. Got it. Yeah. So something that you're like, save as PDF, 
from a computer, not something that you've scanned into the computer. That that makes sense. Um, thank you, Shika, for that question. Also, Daisy and Ujwal, all of you for participating. Uh, so the GPT 3.5 model, um, well, maybe for anyone who doesn't know, what is GPT 3.5? And then also, does it work with that? <laughs> I think this one uh, connects natively. So it's like a bring your own key to Azure's open AI. I think it's uh, GPT-4 only. Uh, be wrong on that, but I don't think we have the capability to switch between models yet, but I would look to that as a vision thing changing, hopefully within a couple quarters. Uh, don't want to promise anything, but yeah. right now it's a uh, bring your own key for Azure's open AI uh, GPT-4. Um, and then one more question before, oh, more, more questions coming in. This is great. Um, so Brett asks, what advice do you have for developers looking to integrate AI into their applications? Um, well, I, I will just say to start, like for me, Avid makes it pretty easy because Julian and Sam and engineering, they do all the hard work of the, the actual engineering and then create this low code experience for you. Same as connected systems and component plugins and all of these things, right? Like uh, we have developers who create it and make it Appianified so that Appian developers can really easy integrate it. Um, any other advice? Yeah, actually that's a fantastic segue. Um, <laughs> why, 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 why up the slides is um, kind of a perfect segue right there. Um, yeah, so our team has been working very diligently since ChatGPT came out and this whole kind of AI renaissance happened uh, to make plugging AI into your applications basically as easy as possible. So kind of our phase one, if you will, was just raw connectors. Um, we know that you guys are developers, um, you guys tend to like to hack away, be very flexible with what you want to do. So we thought, all right, let's just provide raw connectors to basically uh, all the major AI services that we could. So we got Azure OpenAI, OpenAI, Claude's coming soon. Um, down the line, we'll have AI21, Bedrock potentially, um, just this whole suite of AI connectors that basically, uh, if you think of your ChatGPT experience, ChatGPT is the UI for OpenAI. So that's the interface that you interact with. But Think of that experience, but you can plug that directly into your Appian application, ask it whatever you want, uh, connecting to all the various endpoints. Uh, for example, for the OpenAI one, it connects to Whisper, which is their audio model. So you can get instant audio to text translation, transcription um, with basically the newest cutting edge audio, um, audio large language models. Uh, we've also got Dolly 3 in there. So if you want to generate some pictures, um, I'm not sure if you've been paying attention to like the digital art scene, but it's really exploding right now. It's it's really like I can't even, which yeah, which is a good and bad thing, but I can't even tell the difference between what's generated and what's not. That's a whole other ethical conversation we could totally dive into. I I will um, say yeah. for the uh, for the ad for the Appy in Europe live build challenge, I had this vision in my head, but I'm like not very artsy creative, and I did use. Uh, ChatGPT to be like, hello, I'm looking for this sort of thing. Here's the vibes I'm going for and did a few iterations. And then I was able to send that to our Appian creative team and be like, hey, I would like something that looks similar to this. So yeah, it could yeah, be helpful, perfect. but specific use cases that still involve artists. They're coming like, after you, Julie. Yeah, I totally. guess. Uh, <laughs> You can Sorry take it. Yeah, said too much, we, man. We can take a second because there's a, another records chat question, and maybe the sirens will leave. So I'll send this to you, Lewis. Does records chatbot support all languages? Um, yeah. So I I don't have the list of exact languages that it supports. I'm not sure if it supports all languages in the entire world, but it, it does support more than just English. Um, we actually, on our Appian Europe main stage uh, a couple of months ago, had a uh, customer from the uh, Netherlands present, and the presentation was entirely in Dutch, or at least the, the demo. Um, so it, it supports a wide variety of languages and is not limited to just English. Cool. Um, all right, Julian, maybe your sirens are ready. You can jump back into your <laughs> presentation <laughs> yeah. here. Awesome. Um, so yeah, we've got a bunch of AI connectors and we also got Pinecone uh, and we're going to dive into exactly what this is. 
Um, but right now you have to know that it's a vector database. This basically enables some semantic search capabilities. Um, and actually, if we want to go to the next slide, we can talk about um, some of the, the Gen AI tools that we're building right now. So um, we started off with uh, five of kind of like the most asked for features when we talk to customers, partners, um, and these are your basic bread and butter AI use cases for generative AI, right? You got document summarizer. So you plug in any PDF document, uh, you ask for a, a brief summary of it. If the document's too big, um, I'm not sure how familiar you are with uh, context window, but for a lot of these large language models, you can basically only provide it a certain length of document. Well, our plugin go, go ahead, um, our plugin basically handles that all for you. So you can plug in a giant document We'll basically split it up into separate chunks, summarize all those chunks, and then provide a summary of those summaries. So you really can get the full context of the entire document summarized by a large language model. Um, you can think of all these as basically wrappers on top of the OpenAI or Azure OpenAI um, large language model. But instead of having to build in that like native chunking, native summary of summaries, loop through it, all of that logic, we'll handle all that for you on the back end. Um, next, the we got. The more yeah, you yeah. talk, Julian, the more I, I trust you because it's you know it sounds like you're really doing all this uh, hard technical work on the back end for us. So, uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> appreciate it. Um, we, we have uh, one quick question. Also, yeah, I just quick. wanted to make the point again to the audience, like uh, Julian is uh, very technical and deep in these things. So if you have more technical questions, because I know sometimes it can be scary when, oh, you just drag and drop it. How is this working? Um, so if you have more technical questions, please throw them uh, in the chat to Julian. But the one question that just came in is, uh, what regions is the functionality available for? So maybe like Copilot, Record Chat, and, and the plugins, what features, uh, US only or what? Yeah, so I can, I can speak for Records Chat at, at least. Um, Records Chat's currently available in um, Northern Virginia, Ohio, and also in Frankfurt. Um, so we do look forward to rolling out incrementally to, to more regions. Um, Sam or Julian can correct me if I'm wrong, but some of the other functionality, especially the, the plugins that we're referencing that use Azure OpenAI um, have wider regional availability. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have the Azure Docs pulled up in front of me, but yeah, it, they've, it, it's widely available. As long as you bring your own key and set up the um, the instance in your local region, you're, you should be totally set. Cool. Um, all right, back back to you, Julian. Le the pine cone uh, is that that what we're seeing here? Pine cone. Um, yeah. Let, let's let's go back one slide. There's a couple other. Yeah. Before we go into that awesome little slide right there. Yeah. Perfect. Um, so just going down the list of Gen AI tools, we've also got our entity extractor. Um, you can basically think of this as kind of like a document extractor, AI skill type of thing, but using a large language model. Um, so say you have like an HR application, uh, application and you're reviewing resumes and you want to extract from a bunch of resumes the education of a person. And in their resume, they might call it college, they might call it university, they might call it education, they might call it schooling, you know, all these different words. Um, with traditional AI, right, you would have to think up all those different synonyms, write them down as exact keywords. Um, maybe you could get like a set like a fuzzy match if they like misspell school, it would capture it. But really, it's really rules based, you have to think ahead of time exactly what you want it to catch. Uh, but with this sort of plugin, you can pass in that, that PDF document and just say, I want education. And then the large language model is actually smart enough to extract, okay, by education, we know that you mean college. So this line on the resume that says college, University of Arkansas, uh, it'll be able to extract that for you. So really intelligent um, uh, document extraction. Uh, next up, email generation. Uh, I'm sure you guys have used GPT for, um, for writing things, writing emails. I certainly do, writing code. It's fantastic at generating content. Um, so we have like a nice little email generation uh, plugin. You can say how long you want it and what kind of format you want it. Easy, uh, a couple of easy like dials that you can turn so that you don't really have to go through the trouble of prompt engineering of, of doing this like um, this long iteration cycle of okay, make it two paragraphs, but then don't say this and say this. Um, you can just have some couple of dials and custom instructions that you can give it. Um, and then the next two are really for you devs out there. Uh, the, the other three kind of end user features. 
uh, next to her for you devs. We got data generation. Really excited about this one. Um, basically, you plug in a record. Um, it works on a single record or um, uh, a record with relationships. So one to many, many to one, one to one. You plug in that record, that relationship, and you can actually generate sample data for that record. Um, so you can be like, all right, we have a user record and order record. We want all users to be from Star Wars. And we want 10 of them, put in a process model, you loop over it like 10 times. Now you have 100 records, all of them instantly written to the data fabric, um, instantly uh, setting up that relationship for you. And boom, you've had a ready to go sample app for you. Um, so that's really exciting. I don't know if any of you set up sample apps, but I have to do it all the time. And it is so tedious I, to go. Yeah. <laughs> The most tedious part really is not even the Appian development. It's the fact that I care so much about it being like a valid use case and the data making sense and all of that stuff. So it is really true. And I like your uh, Star, War Star Wars point. Back when Sam and I were in Academy, my project, I used uh, Game of Thrones characters. Sam, I think if I remember correctly, you did Parks and Rec characters. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> it's it's good to know, Julian, that I can also give it, give it a theme. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And especially if you think of like like case notes or something that has to be like yeah. a long paragraph. Like, sure, there were other libraries out there, other plugins that you could use to generate data, but none of them can generate data where it's like, okay, it's actually referencing the the name of the user. It's actually referencing all the other fields to generate this long text. Yeah. Um, so yeah, yeah, perfectly make like actual sample applications that look pretty realistic. Yeah. Um, kind of along the same lines, data formatter. So say you have users that are submitting a bunch of different addresses in a bunch of different formats. Um, you can tell it, hey, I want the birthday in this format or the address field in this format. And it will go ahead and kind of uh, transform that data into the format that you're actually looking for. Um, so all these we're calling our Gen AI tools, all of which are available on the app market today. Drag and drop, pretty easy to set up. Uh, we're going to be actually producing a bunch of videos on these in the new year. So kind of stay tuned on the Appian community channel. Um, quick note to subscribe if you haven't subscribed yet. I know that's supposed to be at the end. Ring a little bell icon. Yeah, it, all right. all throughout. Remind yeah, us. Yeah, yeah. So subscribe. If you want more Julian, subscribe to the channel. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, we'll have a bunch of videos out, kind of how to set all these up, um, use them in your applications. Um, but the feature that I'm most excited about, um, we've been kind of plowing away, trying to make this as production ready as possible. We're kind of decking it out with all the features right now is our AI knowledge assistant component and the connected system that's backing it, which is our document vector database. Um, so yeah, now's a good point to kind of jump into a little demo. Um, Cal, if you wanna pull that one up. Yeah, uh, I know where to go, but you keep talking, go ahead. Yeah, um, so you heard me mention Pinecone before, vector database, maybe seen a couple like headlines, news articles about it. What is a vector database? Um, before we jump into the architecture, I'll just say that it enables semantic search. Instead of doing keyword search, which is like, all right, exact match of, if you remember the college example, exact match of college to college. Um, instead of that, you can kind of ask it a question or like give it some natural language and have it find the correct information for you. Um, so right here we have our case management solution. Also another shout out, download it, check it out, amazing kind of template for building uh, Appian apps off of. Um, case management solutions. Uh, this is a case about, let's see, procurement and fraud investigation. We got, what, five, six documents, each like hundreds of pages long. <coughs> a little bit sick right now. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we've got a bunch of documents on here, hundreds of pages long. Let's say that I'm a caseworker. I've got a question. I'm doing this fraud investigation, super important. I wanna be timely, I wanna be thorough. I wanna make sure my answers have quality are actually referencing the documents. Um, instead of having to manually click through each and every document, scroll through, maybe use that like command F, like search for exact keywords in all the documents to find the answer to my question. I can just like search up exactly what I'm looking for with our AI knowledge assistant chatbot. What is um, fraud? <laughs> yeah, what, what is fraud? Uh, oh, no. <laughs> um, you know who does know what fraud is? This long ass document right here. So let's go to the. <laughs> <laughs> um, nice. uh, let's go to this first source right here, uh, and then if we actually click on that little blue link right there, um, yes, yeah, so on that blue link, and then if you scroll down below, 
I think it's the below. Down one or opening? Yes, uh, down. Okay. All the way down. Where am I scrolling to? Uh, click on the blue link. I am, but I don't know what's happening on my. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. All right. Live demo. Barrels of a live demo. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe Kyle, while you click around for a second, we do have a few questions that came in from Rupa. So thanks for your question. So prerequisites to consider for Copilot. Uh, the document thing we mentioned earlier, so a PDF that has text fields, uh, I forget the exact uh, phrasing that you used, Lewis, but uh, you know, not a scanned document, something that you download and, and the computer knows, oh, here are what the text fields are. Uh, any other prerequisites uh, besides thinking about something like that? Um, yeah, so it, it depends on the Copilot feature we're, we're talking about, as you mentioned, for the um, the PDF to interface feature, uh, having a natively digital PDF is is one, as well as the uh, credentials to Azure OpenAI. Yeah. Um, for records chat, which is also under the Copilot branding, um, so having a site currently, as I mentioned, it's only available in those few regions. Um, so having your site be in one of those three regions I mentioned. Um, over time, we do want to enable this feature for sites in other regions. Um, those are really only the the, the prerequisites that I can think of. Um, cool. Um, and for also for record chat, two other questions. Where do the responses come from? And is the security restricted? So Rupa, I don't know if you joined in late. We touched on some of these uh, earlier in the uh, discussion, but maybe uh, Lewis, you could do a quick summary of where the response is from and how's the security on it. Yeah, so the, the responses come from a large language model within um, Appian security and compliance boundary. Um, and then as for so security, um, it's both the security that the Appian platform provides to, to you as a customer, um, but also we use Appian's native records uh, object security to make sure that the uh, person interacting with the chatbot can't get information out of the, the record that they shouldn't have access to. Cool. Um, and Julian, uh, earlier, uh, Lewis mentioned private AI, uh, and you know, you're talking about all these other different AIs that we can connect to. What is the difference between private AI and maybe uh, Azure or, uh, you know, open AI or, you know, all, all of these that exist? Yeah, so we're building all you can kind of think of it as a spectrum really um so on the least private uh end of the spectrum we have our consumer products uh think of chat gpt right this is a ui you go directly to open ai you make an account with them uh you have this nice little chatbot ui that they provide you and if you actually read their terms and conditions they basically say we own this data whatever you type in here we own we can train on it we can do whatever we want with this Obviously, for business enterprise use cases, that's not going to be acceptable. We don't want to feed them all of our private data. Um, but for consumer use cases, I use it all the time. Who cares if they have my data? You know, enterprises, <laughs> not so much. Um, so that's Who cares if they know I'm trying to plan a murder mystery party? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then OpenAI, right? That's the company that makes ChatGPT, the consumer product. They also have what's called an API. So you can use an integration. I showed off the connected systems before. To hit that API. Now, on the on the spectrum of least uh, like least private to most private, they're a little bit further over. Their terms and conditions say, "Hey, we won't train on it. Anything that you hit with the API, uh, we won't train on it. But we're going to keep it in our servers for a week to two weeks for due diligence or something like that. Having enterprise business data stored on someone else's servers for a couple of weeks, eh, not so great, right? So it's a little bit less secure. Um, now." To complicate things a little bit more, right? We got Microsoft's OpenAI service. So Microsoft and OpenAI, very much buddy buddy. Microsoft gave ten billion dollars worth of funding. <laughs> for AI. That's a lot of money. That's a lot of money. They're very good friends. Uh, Microsoft has an enterprise offering of OpenAI, and they say, "Hey, we're not going to train on it. We're not going to store it on your servers, uh, on on our servers. Uh, we're not going to keep it at all. We're fully secure. This is using using our Azure platform. Um, this is." Um, where you're sending it to them, you're using OpenAI through them, but they're not storing it on it, they're not training on it. Definitely better. We like those terms and conditions a lot more, especially for enterprise. Um, so that's kind of good enough for us to use our co uh, our yeah copilot form, giving the PDF data. They're not storing on it. They're not training on it. Uh, it's your own open uh, it's your own Azure OpenAI key, so it's 
your account, right? You own it. Um, and yeah, um, so that's, that's all secure. And then kind of the most secure, what we're calling like private AI is everything that we're building on uh, ourselves on top of your, your enterprise security and compliance boundaries. So this is not leaving your appian instance, not leaving um, our servers that we set up for you. Um, this is all kind of things we set up and manage for you. This is appian private AI, right? Fully secure. We're not training on it. We're not storing it. It's all within your, your boundary. You're not setting up the separate Azure instance that talks to Appian, right? It's all, it's all set up within Appian. Um, and that's what we're building Copilot on top of. That's what we're building. Uh, Self-service analytics, a new feature that just came out this past quarter. Definitely check it out. Super, super cool. Um, and there, there's a bunch of features coming next quarter and the quarter after that. Don't really want to spoil yet, but there's, there's entire big teams working on all of this. So we've got a lot of really, really cool stuff coming. Um, and that's all built on a Appian's private AI. Um, cool. So Spectrum, chat GPT least, uh, our, our private AI is most. Yeah. Julian, back to your, your demo. I mean, that's a perfect explanation. But this, what do you think is the biggest value add here where your, your vector search, your semantic search of the documents of the case, just having that 360 degree um, reach of all that case data plus the document data, that all that information is trapped in there. But then it's almost kind of opening up the black box of AI and yeah. shining light where you're getting the sources and the annotations. So I don't know if you could talk about that because I think that's one of, when I show this and to people, customers, they, they really like that because it, it, it gives that trust layer, right? Like when I generate the email from this or I have to do some sort of legal clerk work, I know I can trust this answer because it's backed by these sources. So maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, that's a fantastic point, Sam. Um, so these large language models, right? We don't really know what went into them, what they're trained on, what they know. And they're not answering questions based off of your own documents, right? So we're kind of bridging the gap right now. And we say, okay, of course you guys have data. You have record data, you have document data. We all store it for you in Appian. <clears throat> But we want to give the LLMs the capability to actually use that data to answer the question. So it's actually grounded in what you want it to be grounded in, not just answering based off of the internet or publicly. Yeah. So what this is actually doing, you're asking a question. Um, yeah. Yeah. And hallucinations. This is this is definitely reducing hallucinations. Um, <laughs> no, no, actually, this, oh. no, I'm fully up with the benchmarks. Like it, it definitely helps. Like, and I will say double check the answers it's giving you and that's exactly why we have the sources there you see boom exactly what documents it's coming from exactly what sections it's coming on let's try this one more time kyle click on document name it should pull up the yeah that one right there that's yeah, fine um but yeah it, it's set up so that you, it pulls up the actual pdf down below um we can just go back to the pdf and kind of um, oh wait there it is wow yeah, you just yeah. gotta scroll right. down oh you didn't uh maybe you did <laughs> Oh, she's not going to bring me back. <laughs> um, and we're actually embedding the PDF viewer in the document, so you don't have to like kind of do it separately. But right now, it, it embeds. It shows you what page. Uh, highly recommend ask it a question, see the answer. You're like, okay, that makes sense, and then verify the answer. This is the whole human in the loop. I could go into a whole marketing spiel, but like no. basically double-check AI. No, no, no. It's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. AI is great for speeding you up, but it, it's not the end-all, be-all double check your answers. Yeah. Um, so this has been crazy. This hour has gone by really fast. So I, we only have a, a few more minutes. Want to make sure we wrap up. We have one question in the chat that I see right now. I'll ask this to the, to the folks and uh, people tuning in at home. This is your chance to get in any last questions. Uh, and then we'll wrap up. I will announce the um, dev survey raffle winners and then uh, bid adieu for 2023. So Question, does the semantic search happen via the database file that gets generated? Is there any external location where we can see data of the uploaded files in the vector DB? Great question. Um, yes, so this is all on Appian server, right? We don't, we're not using any other vector database service. And this is kind of the great thing about using this plugin. It's all stored kind of as a document in your own Appian instance. Um, right now we're not exposing that kind of database publicly, but you can see what documents are in it. Uh, and then you can query it and you can generate a response using it. And that's all stored locally. The only thing that's being sent out is um, those trunks of document data, along with the question when you're actually um, querying uh, the, the AI assistant, sending that to ChatGPT. Cool. Thank you, Julian. All right. So I'm not not seeing any anything else uh, coming in, but I guess I'll 
rapid fire round, just uh, something that you're look forward, looking forward to doing with all the extra time you'll have since AI is going to be helping you with your work. Uh, Julian. <laughs> Um, my life is pretty much AI right now, so researching more AI. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sam? Um, yeah, it's kind of just thinking more about where all this is going. Like, uh, Julian, what was that feature with the, the generating the synthetic data or record data? Yeah, yeah, the data generator plugin. Yeah, I was when you were showing that, I was thinking like, what, like all this simulated data, is that, that actually might become more real than our, than our actual data. Because at some point, so this is with all the extra time, I'm going to be thinking about questions like this, because when GPT, when OpenAI first released the first foundational model, we were all starting to, as consumers using it, that set, that snapshot was the last time all the public, all the information has ever been collected to make a foundational model. That was the last time before these large language models were released. So that was the snapshot of everything before an LLM. And since then, all the data that's gone into it has been assisted and augmented by LLMs. Yeah. So then what is real anymore? So with all the extra time, I'm going to be thinking about that. <laughs> I just, I, Sam, really driving me nuts. Not Sam, I wish, I wish you would have just said, I'm going to go skateboard more. No, uh, or <laughs> no. Lewis, fun answer? Yeah, I think I'm just going to be relaxing over the holidays. I, <laughs> Maybe nice. doing some some pondering of deep questions like what Sam just said, but uh, <laughs> looking forward to having a bit more time to to take a break. Kyle, I think Sam needs some help with his research. So <laughs> oh my, let's go. Guys. All right, I got well, one on board. Let's go, Kyle. Basically, we're using the extra time to come up with even cooler stuff for y'all. So. Um, I will be relaxing with Lewis, but uh, I'll bring the other guys back on when they, they've come up with something. Uh, anyway, thank, thank you all for joining today. You have been really great guests, very knowledgeable. I hope that you are all willing to come back again uh, to the YouTube channel because we have uh, a lot of big plans for the YouTube channel next year. So I uh, hope you had fun. Thanks for joining. I'll, pa I'll say goodbye to you so I can do all the ending housekeeping. Toodaloo. Goodbye. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So first off, uh, that was great. Secondly, let's pull up the winners of the raffles. All right. So developer survey winner, past to Appian World. We have Bhushan Shivan, five days of training, Inez Gomes, Appian branded speaker. We have uh, Selmawit Ngida, Sanjay Sisla, and Sydney Dawson. And then for the 150 certification vouchers, check your emails because we will be sending those out. Probably take another 20 minutes for me to read 150 names. Um, so thanks all for participating and uh, keep a lookout for more surveys in the future. And last but not least, our next live stream will be uh, on January 11th, and it will be all around fine tuning applications for performance. So if you want to hit the new year running with really performant applications, come tune in then to learn how. Hope everyone has a great holiday season. Thank you for coming along on this YouTube journey with us, and we can't wait to bring you more great live streams next year. See you, Al.